Thank you for being here on a Friday chapel. Uh, I know as the papers uh, get close and the tests uh, show up, there may be a temptation to say, I could use this time elsewhere. Uh, I just need to let you know over the years, uh, watching God show up in uh, unique opportunities in chapel times, I'm here today because of uh, somebody that no one knew as far as what we might call a no-name speaker who showed up, opened the word of God, touched my heart in the middle of a chapel, and I am doing what I'm doing in many ways because of that one single chapel that if I had missed, I don't know where I would have been. Uh, God is sovereign, but he was sovereign on that day in a very special way. This is a part of the community. It's a part of our fellowship together. It's a high priority for us, and uh, we hope it'll continue to be for you uh, throughout the semester. Uh, whatever days you're on campus, uh, make this a part of that, and we're, we're grateful for your being here. It's a privilege to introduce Rick Kallenberg. Dr. Kallenberg has been teaching Bible, theology, and missions uh, since 1974. He served for 16 years on the faculty of the Moody Bible Institute and Theological Seminary. In 1984, he and his family joined SIM and moved to Nigeria. Uh, to serve on the faculty uh, of Josh uh, Equa Theological Seminary. His 10 years of uh, missionary service in Nigeria included evangelism, uh, church planting uh, with seminary students, and three years as the SIM Nigeria director. He uh, retired from SIM uh, not too long ago, having served 12 years as the Northwest Regional Director. He continues to minister in nine countries of Africa and the international director of the Romans Project, as you've heard. It's a pastoral training and resource ministry focusing on bringing the core of the gospel to the world uh, that uh, not only presents it in a positive way, but also helps eliminate all of the frack and the uh, uh, extra stuff that doesn't need to be around that too often accompanies a cultural expression, whether here or there. Uh, it's a privilege Rick, to have you on our team. He's married to Carol. They have four daughters, three sons-in-laws, and eight grandchildren. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Rick Kallenberg? Thank you, Dr. Bailey, and thank you for showing up on Friday Chapel. This is your favorite no-name speaker today. <laughs> no, I'm seriously so honored to be here, and I think some congratulations are in order. You've survived syllabus shock. <laughs> Three weeks of school, and you're into the groove. You know, we talk in missions classes about culture shock, and some of the same effects of culture shock have hit you as students here at D uh, Dallas Seminary. Things like uh, disorientation, um, confusion, anxiety, fear. Uh, I got to tell you, uh, I, wrote a, I, I gave a survey to my students in my classes. I had 33 in the classes, and I asked them, what do you fear most? And specifically, what about DTS causes you the most anxiety? Okay, here are the answers. <laughs> you can guess most of them. Uh, the amount of work and the time needed to accomplish that work. Uh, missing deadlines, the fear and anxiety that comes with that potential. Um, finances, obviously, we all face the reality of that as students. Failure, failure to make the grade, failure to finish the course. Feeling, this is an interesting one, feeling not qualified. And this one was profound, unworthy of being a DTS student. Feeling inferior to other students who seem to know everything. And then the one, the last one, balancing the spiritual life with the academic all of us have some fears that we're dealing with this morning. I got to tell you about my experience arriving in Dallas Seminary in 1968. I was full of anxiety. I didn't know what to expect. I'd had a tough summer. I was only 21 years old. I'd been in a ministry context that was very difficult. And I just knew God had brought me to Dallas Seminary. And whatever that meant, I was ready. But we got to class, and Haddon Robinson, our professor in personal evangelism, I thought, we'll just talk about the syllabus. He started in a lecture, Dr. Burns will remember, no cake today, I still have the notes from that lecture. Profound impact, first class. He says, you can read the syllabus, I've got something to tell you. That was impactive. Uh, then we had uh, Dr. Walkie. <laughs> you heard about Dr. Walkie during Her Heritage Week from Ron Allen. 
Uh, our first OTI exam, only Dr. Burns made an A. I made a 55, and that was a C plus. <laughs> we sat and listened to this man, and we're just overwhelmed at his knowledge, and we just seemed lost right from the start. And yet, in the grace of God, we made it. Then we go into Ch Chafer Chapel, and uh, the professors would walk on the platform, and we'd sit there in awe. And I always remembered, I pitied the poor preachers in chapel. Because there was S. Lewis Johnson with his Bible that had both the Hebrew and Greek in it. And he's checking you out <laughs> as you <laughs> preach. And so I never anticipated getting this opportunity. But you know, I, I saw another side of the professors too. Believe it or not, in those days, we had Hebrew class on Saturday morning for two years. And we would go to Hebrew class, and then to take out our frustrations, we went up here to this park on Live Oak and played touch football. And would you believe our Hebrew prof... Don Glenn would come and play with us. <laughs> and I was amazed because I would have thought of all the people who wouldn't come to play football, it'd be Don Glenn. But we enjoyed him so much. And I want to tell you the rest of the story. Uh, Dr. Burns told you about Art Farstead and the coffee. Do you remember that? The coffee landing on him at that uh, reception. I want to tell you about Art Farstead. Because I was so afraid of Greek and Hebrew, I had passed the entrance Greek exam, but I was so afraid I didn't know what I was doing because other guys were taking this baby Greek, I decided to take baby Greek. And Art Farstad was the teacher. When I came back my sec for my second year, I had been working at a camp, made very little money, and I didn't have enough money to continue in school. Art Farstad, when he heard about my need, he said, you come live with me. And we lived on a in a little house on the other side on Washington Street. And it was that through that man's grace that uh, I'm here today and we were able to finish seminary without any debt. He went on to become the editor of the New King James Bible. He's with the Lord now. But there was another side to those professors. And in the course of time, we were so privileged to get to know them. Let me ask you this. And let me tell you how we coped with the uh, challenges of seminary in those days. The fear promoted hard work and we worked very hard. We had friendships that really encouraged us in the, in the student body. And for me, it was reading and rereading some of my favorite Bible promises, and inevitably, I ended up in the servant songs of Isaiah, and that's where we want to look today. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40. In Isaiah chapters 1 to 39, we know that there's the message of judgment, and Isaiah delivers that message, and it's a very profound and beautiful section of Scripture. But then in chapter 40, there's a dramatic change. And from judgment, we now are hearing about grace and compassion and comfort. And we see the sovereign Lord at work on behalf of His people in an amazing way. His covenant faithfulness and His chesed, as we heard about from Ron Allen. I have to quote Ron Allen from his message, was so good. The definitive self-disclosure of God, who really is what He really is. And if you go to his Facebook, you'll always see chesed or chesed as his primary and amazing characteristic. But let me give you the background of our passage today. You know, as we heard from uh, Dr. Bailey, that in chapter 6, Isaiah was called to the ministry about 740. And then in chapters 36 to 39 of Isaiah, we have the passage describing this uh, Sennacherib crisis. And that was in 701 BC. We know that the ministry of Isaiah continued into about 680 and so we're in that period of time. After Isaiah's life, a number of things happened that are crucial to us understanding the message of Isaiah chapter 40 to 66. Babylon will come on the scene and defeat Assyria, who was in, the, in power in those days at the time of Isaiah's ministry. Then Egypt that would be defeated by Babylon at the Battle of Carchemish in 605. And then you have Nebuchadnezzar taking Three groups of captives, 605, 597, 586. And in 586, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. What's the back? Why is that important background? Because apparently, this message that's being written by Isaiah in his day is really for people that are going to live 165 years later, during the time of the post-captivity period. People who will come back to the land in the providence and grace and power of God who will be surrounded by all sorts of things that would cause them fear. And so God is speaking into their lives through a prophet years before this would ever happen. You see, isn't it wonderful how God knows our life from beginning to end? He knows what's going on now. He knows how he's been bringing us to this point, but he also knows our future. 
it's very interesting how God works, and I've got to give an example from my own life. In 2012, I had become the director of the Romans Project a year before, and I realized even though I loved the Northwest, I didn't have to stay there. And for family reasons, my parents-in-law uh, uh, lived with us, and they were from Bedford, Texas. I had a daughter and son-in-law and two grandchildren down here, and we had two that were willing to come with us. So for family reasons, we moved back to Texas. I always told my wife, we'll never go back to Texas. But 40 years later, we, we came back. Little did I know that in the providence of God, an opportunity to teach at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, my alma mater, would come to me in that whole process. But God knew. And so here I am, by the grace of God. And it's so exciting to see how God works in our lives. And as we look back, we see how, how he worked. I've got another story, really, from, from those days in seminary. When we had Walkie, we had him for, Dr. Walkie, we had him for Hebrew exegesis. And he chose Isaiah as our exegetical passages. And we all had a passage to do. And uh, here's my copy of Isaiah with all my notes. 40 to 55, I got them all. I can, I, in those days, I could parse any word. I could translate any section. Would you believe in the providence of God again? When I was doing my doctoral work, I had a Hebrew qualifying exam. That was just one piece of many pieces that we had to fulfill. Would you believe they assigned me the servant songs of Isaiah? So I already had so much of the work done. It was just a matter of review. And God, again, provided so graciously for me in that way. Well, Isaiah chapter 40 to 55, the comfort and assurance to these return captives is being given to us in God's wonderful message to them through Isaiah that had been given years before. In chapter 41, we see God speaking. I, in chapter 40, you really have to read this passage because all the great themes that are in this section uh, and in this, these servant songs are brought to us. Look at chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service is completed and her sin has been paid for. She has received uh, from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. He's saying, the captivity's over, and the judgment that I brought on you is over. I have fulfilled my purpose. And by the way, there are lots of purposes fulfilled in that captivity, including getting rid of idolatry. And you'll never have idolatry as a problem in Israel as a result of that. So God was working his providential plan at that time. But then we get into the section where you know, it's time for God to show up, and we have a passage where it's basically identified with John the Baptist in the New Testament. And I won't read these verses to you, but, <clears throat> excuse me, but he, as the pr proclaimer and forerunner, is getting things ready spiritually and otherwise for the Messiah to come. And so then a voice, verse 6, cries out, and what shall we cry? Men are like grass, but the God who is the God of the Bible and whose word is, is the truth he, his word stands forever, verse 8. And so verse 9 then, you who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout, lift it up, do not be afraid. Those that proclaim this message shouldn't be afraid. Fear is going to be a primary issue as we're going to see it develop in this section. And then verse 10, see the sovereign Lord comes with power. God is going to show up. He's going to show up in power and authority and strength. And then in verse 11, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. I, I just love the picture of strength on the one hand, toughness and tenderness. That's our God. And, you know, there's another verse in that song that we sang today, and it, it relates to us older people. He says in verse, verse 5, Even down to old age all my people shall prove my sovereign, eternal, unchangeable love. And then when gray hairs shall their temples adorn, like lambs they shall still in my bosom be born. This thing of God's tender shepherding of our lives continues throughout life. And what a comfort it is, not only to know that God is with us and strengthening and empowering us and accomplishing his purpose for us, but he's tenderly ministering to us at the point of our need. Well, he goes on in, in this passage, and I, I, you, uh, Dr. Belly mentioned the Romans Project. I love chapter 11, and verse 34 is quoted, uh, basically quoting verses 13 and 14. 
that this great God, you can't explain Him, you can't figure out His purposes, but His purposes are going to be accomplished, and we need to trust Him and His wisdom. And then in uh, verses 18 and following, to whom then will you compare God? There's no one you can compare to. And one of the themes in the servant songs is how the pagans are looking for help with their idols. And it's almost a mockery when how foolish that you would trust an, an idol that you made when in fact there is this great eternal God who is sovereign over all and the creator of all. So then the challenge in verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden? You know, sometimes it seems like God's not there, but in fact, for those 70 years God's been working, He's been preparing the situation, and He's been ultimately preparing the way in world history for the people to return. He's been very active and very present, even though at times they didn't seem to sense that. And maybe in your challenges as a student here, you're experiencing sometimes that, that dearth of the sense of the presence of God. Let me tell you my experience. When I was writing my dissertation and all the challenges of that, I was holed up in a, in a conference room in, in Moody. I had to move away from my family because that was the only way I could concentrate. And it was the hardest experience ever, academically, I ever went through. And I had my, back in those days, there were no computers. I had my boxes with my handwritten notes, one, two, three, four, five. And I had to write everything out by hand. But I tell you, I sensed the presence of God in that place, perhaps like I've rarely sensed it. My hardest challenge was his opportunity to comfort, encourage, and give me wisdom, which I desperately needed. You see, in our toughest times, we need to look around. The Lord's there. And in fact, let's get into chapter 41. He really shows up because now he starts to speak. And now he starts out by speaking specifically to the unbelieving nations. And he says, be silent before me, O you islands, all the scattered peoples of the world. Look, let the nations renew their strength. Who is this that's been working in history? You need to acknowledge that it's Yahweh of Israel who, in fact, has brought into history a conqueror named Cyrus. He's not named here, but he's named later in chapters 44 and 45. You see, before Cyrus's mom ever named him, before maybe she was ever born, God knew who he was going to raise up to not only remove the Babylonians, but have a whole new foreign policy to allow the Israelites and other nations to go back to their land, thinking that would empower their loyalty to, to him as the, the king. And he was the king of Medo-Persia. And it's an amazing story. God was doing that. You see, in verse 4, I, the Lord, I, Yahweh, with the first of them and with the last of them, I'm he. I'm the one that's been doing this. I'm the one that's in charge of history, thank you. And when the nations of the world recognize that, then they've, they've heard the truth and they will respond and come to know. And of course, missions is all about it. Israel in those days proclaiming the, the glories of that king and our privilege today to carry the message of that same wonderful God and Savior, Jesus Christ, in our day. In, in verse 4, when he says that, I, I've got to read Piper's quote here. It's really good. He says, here is a picture of God not only judging the nations and ruling the rulers of the earth, but calling all nations of the earth into being. God is the first. He's the absolute reality before all other reality and on which all other reality depends. He is the uncreated first, and he will be there with the last when all is accomplished according to his eternal purpose. All of these events then and all the events we see in our world today are working out ultimately to God's sovereign purposes. The missio dei is going to be accomplished, and we have a part in our generation to be a part of God's purpose, to proclaim his glories to the nations. What an incredible God we serve and what a, what a tremendous opportunity we have. And I'll put in a plug for the missions courses. We'll empower you the more for that very challenging task. And I hope you'll take some of those courses. So what's the response of the nations? It's fear. It's fear. Not fear in terms of reverential awe and worship, but fear, what are we going to do? Uh, trembling. What, what are we going to do? Panic. What are we going to do? And so they tremble, verse 5. So what do they do? They resort to what, the only thing they know. 
these drop-in-the-bucket nations who are less than nothing in the mind and the hands of God in chapter 40 are making idols. And they're trying to encourage each other in the making of idols and, and trying to find some hope in those hopeless objects of worship. You see, they're pursuing some form of security, but it's, it's not going to be there. I had the privilege of working in Africa, and, and pagans, pagans have a mindset. They, they're looking for power. You see, those cultures are fear power. They're looking for the strongest God, and that's why when we proclaim the God of the Bible, he's not only the Redeemer, but he's the powerful God who they've known about in an, up there, but they never really have known personally, who's made himself known in the Lord Jesus Christ. So these are pagans just doing their thing. But also the people of God are also fear, fearing. And we see in chapter 41, verse 10, verse 13, chapter 43, chapter 44, God's people are fearing. Why were they fearing? Well, here's where we got to bring in Ezra and Nehemiah to get more of the background of what these returned captives were facing. They had adopted a new language and culture. And so it was a change for them to move back to their homeland, and many of them had been born during that time. They were leaving settled homes and an unknown situ to go to an unknown situation. There were travel dangers along the way. In fact, Nehemiah, when he went back, one of the three returns, he had an armed escort. The prospect of hard work was, was, was daunting for them, rebuilding the temple and then later the city. The opposition of the enemy was real, and in Ezra 4.4, 4, we read, Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid in, in, to go on building. And Nehemiah records that there was actually ridicule that was going on. There was threat of attack. These people had reasons to fear. But God's message given 165 years before was exactly what they needed. So what was that message? Well... Fear not. Fear not. Look at verse 10. This is the, the main passage that I want to focus on today because that's the passage that has meant most to me in the course of my life as I've looked to God's encouragement from His Word in times when I was struggling. And maybe some of those same things you've faced as you've come to seminary. Uh, maybe some people didn't understand why you chose to come to seminary. Maybe you felt some opposition or discouragement because of that. When we went to the mission field, none of, neither my wife's parents or my own parents ever really affirmed us in that. In fact, they thought we were crazy, leaving a good job at Moody Bible Institute. Why are you going over there? There's people to minister to right where you are. Why are you going over there? They didn't understand. And sometimes that can bring a discouragement to us, that, that opposition that's not blatant, but it's real. You see, ultimately, opposition to God's purpose in our lives comes from the enemy. And he uses a lot of different means. Do we see it for what it is? And do we have the answer that comes from Scripture in passages like Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10? You see, beginning in verse 16, the sovereign Lord is now speaking to Israel. He's speaking directly to his people. And he calls them my servant, if you look in the text there. It's the first use of the term servant that becomes the theme so much of this section. Not only is Israel the servant, Messiah is the servant, and the suffering Messiah is the servant of the Lord. He's been, uh, Israel has been chosen by Yahweh from all the nations. They're in the family of Abraham, his, and they are part of the covenant God's made. They're called. They've been called out of... Abraham was called out of Ur. Israel was called out of Egypt, and it's like a second... Exodus, they've been now called out of Babylon. God is calling his people for his purpose. He has a purpose that he's going to accomplish for them and through them, and they need to be strengthened by that reality. They are not rejected, he says, which is really interesting because they would have felt maybe that Babylonian uh, captivity would have been a form of, of rejection by God. And even though in Hosea he talks about having to divorce his wife, in fact, he's committed and he's bringing his people back to himself, both in terms of relationship and ultimately accomplishing his purpose through them. And this is an evidence of that as he gives them these promises and as he works in this context. In Isaiah chapter 41, then verse 10, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you and will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 
we see here a command. We see two reasons to obey the command. And we see three promises that come as God gives them. The first, obviously, the command is don't fear. A great theme in Scripture. And I don't have time to recall all my favorite passages where God starts out. God shows up and the first thing he says or his angel shows up, don't be afraid. And then the message is given, inevitably, a message of hope and encouragement and strength for the task ahead. But then the two reasons, for I am with you. They were in a very new and difficult circumstance. And the Shekinah glory of God had left them as described in Ezekiel chapter 10. But I've got to read a passage from Haggai for you because it really illustrates how God is renewing his work. When Haggai was raised up to challenge them to finish the job of finishing the temple, and you've got to see Haggai and Zechariah in the context here, he makes a statement, he gives a promise, he says, um, I am with you, declares the Lord. And then he promises this in verse um, 9, the glory of this present house, this, this new temple that didn't look like much, wasn't nearly as fancy and glorious as Solomon's. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord. You see, God's purpose was for them. And even though when they compared themselves to the past, it seemed like it wasn't much, yet God was with them in what they were doing and they should find encouragement because it's part of his plan. And what was the temple beautified by Herod that Jesus walked into? It was that temple. You see, God's able to do a new thing in a new context, but we've got to trust his presence. We've got to trust his power and believe that we're in his purpose. And when we do, we'll experience the joy and blessing of fulfilling God's purpose in our own lives. He says, I am with you. The greatest resource in the universe is on our team. And then the three promises we can claim. The, by the way, these are perfect verbs that speak of an event that is an actuality because is actual even though uh, the, the author is committed to affecting it even though it may not take place right away. He says, I strengthen you. I help you. Surely I help you. And the text makes that very clear. That's uh, the, the, the term there. Um, and lastly, I sure, surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And it's sometimes translated victorious or saving right hand. The symbol of the Lord's power to deliver and protect. It, it new, it's nuanced, vindicated righteousness. The strength and power of God's righteousness. And the right hand is the hand of power and salvation. God has a promise for you. And, and by the analogy of faith, I think I can claim this promise because in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and Psalm 18, which he's quoting, it says this, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, so that you can confidently, and we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? You see, we can claim these promises in light of who we are in the plan and purpose of God. We can trust his presence. We can in, in, in depend upon his power and know that he will not only be with us, but he will strengthen us for the task he's called us to do. So I ask you this morning, how are you coping with the challenges of seminary? How are you dealing with the fears that are inevitably part of your life? And they may be other than just academic. On that student survey, I also asked the question, how do you cope? How do you cope with the challenges and fears that you're dealing with? Things like planning ahead, talking to others, being in a community, sleep, <laughs> watching TV and social media. This was my favorite. My, my wife will keep me on track. And it's interesting, almost all the new students also added prayer, listening to God, and reading the Word. 14 out of 19 of the first new students said that. And I don't want to read too much into this, but for the returning students, only 7 out of 14 mentioned that. The fact is, I recommend, when fear comes, turn to the Word. And particularly, I encourage you to turn to the servant songs of Isaiah in places like Isaiah 40 and 41. This past summer, 
I was in Africa. We were in five countries. We were in our fourth country of Ghana, and we were supposed to go to Nigeria. And while we were in, in Ghana, we heard that in Joss, where I was supposed to go and teach a class at the seminary and do some Romans project work, there had been bomb blasts right there in Joss, and hundreds of people were killed. My team said to me, you shouldn't go. Don't dare go. Uh, we're, we're, the guy with me, the, my, the guy that was supposed to go with me said, you know, I don't think I can go. And my wife said, don't go. And when my team challenged me not to go, I said, of course I'm going to go. I mean, that's where I belong. But the Lord convicted me. He said, I want you to process that decision with me. And guess where he led me? The servant songs of Isaiah. And reading those reinforced in my heart and mind the confidence that God was calling me to go and he would take care of me. And he did. And by showing up, I brought tremendous encouragement to the students in the class and others who thought I would bail out. Anything God calls you to do, you can be sure. He's your God, he's with you, and he'll empower you to do it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful promises of your word. Uh, I just love this passage, and you've spoken to me so many times through it. Speak to these dear students in these days of their challenging process with you, accomplishing your word, to believe the promise you've made and be glorified as we all trust you as the great powerful God who's called us to this not only task, but this great calling of proclaiming your glories in our generation. Thank you for what you're teaching us through the process of seminary so that we can um, believe you and trust you when things are even more more serious things are at stake in our lives. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen.